Amen. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. Matthew, chapter 21. I want to talk to you on the subject of how to make Dad glad. Matthew, chapter 21. And let's read verses 28 to 32. Matthew, chapter 21, verses 28 to 32. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 28, the Lord Jesus is speaking, and he says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of them? Twain did the will of their father. They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, That the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for your word. I ask that you'd speak to us through it this morning. Send your sweet and blessed Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide, to guide us into all truth and to give us an understanding. Lord, forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your moving and working in our midst today. And again, we pray that if there's a soul listening today who doesn't know, their, know you as their Savior, that they would come to trust the Lord Jesus in this hour and to be saved. And then for those, Lord, who do know you, pray that you draw our hearts closer and help us to understand the concept of God as our Father. Now we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> it's Father's Day. That's no surprise to anybody here, I don't think. So why do we have Father's Day? Well, <clears throat> It isn't a law. The law doesn't say that we have to have Father's Day. Do you know that? There are certain uh, holidays that are set by law, and uh, we observe those. And most of the federal holidays today, not all of them, somebody pointed out the other day the 4th of July doesn't fall into this category. Most of them are on Mondays. Isn't that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. It's something Congress did back in the 1980s, and they made uh, most of the federal holidays fall on Monday so that people could have a three-day weekend and uh, ha have that three days off in a row as opposed to taking a day off during the week or uh, some other time. But uh, so tomorrow is a federal holiday. But today is Father's Day, and that's not actually a federal holiday. It's a tradition. But it's a good tradition. We have Mother's Day and we have Father's Day because God commanded us to honor our fathers. And so this gives us the opportunity to obey the commandment of God. And that commandment to honor our fathers is given throughout the Bible. We first find it, <clears throat> excuse me, in Exodus chapter 20 in what we commonly call the Ten Commandments. Excuse me a moment. I apologize. I've been <clears throat> dealing with a dry throat quite a bit lately. Uh, Exodus 20, we have the <clears throat> Ten Commandments, which say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet. Now that fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God has given thee, those words appear eight times in the Bible. Exodus 20, 12, Deuteronomy 5, 16, Matthew 15, 4, uh, Matthew 19, 19, Mark 7, 10, Mark 10, 19, Luke 18, 20, and Ephesians 6, 2. Now, if you didn't write all that down, that's fine. Uh, if you really want it, I can give it to you later. 
But in Ephesians 6, 2, <clears throat> it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, <clears throat> which is the first commandment, with promise. Well, what's the promise? The promise is that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So what is the promise? The promise is if you honor your father and your mother, you'll live longer. Now, longer is a relative term. So the natural question that's going to come up is you'll live longer than what? You'll live longer than you'll live if you don't honor your father and mother. It's real simple, okay? Uh, you mean God will add to my lifespan if I honor my parents? That's exactly what it's saying. Well, you mean it will shorten my lifespan if I don't honor my parents? Yes, that's what it means. Well, I know a fellow, he didn't honor his parents at all. He lived a long time. Well, that's all in God's hands, isn't it? He certainly knows. But he lived longer than he, or lived shorter than he would have had he honored his parents. Now, the Lord says something once in Scripture. That's important because God has spoken it. But if he says the same thing in both Testaments, in six books of the Bible, he is definitely wanting to get our attention. So that's why we have Father's Day. Well, let me ask you this. Why is God so interested and so insistent that we honor our parents? Well, to begin with, the word or pronoun father occurs almost a thousand times in the Bible. Now, we're not going to list all of those. Don't get worried. Most of the time, that refers to our human fathers. But more than a hundred times, or more than 10% of the occurrences of the word Father in the Bible, at least in our English Bible, it refers to our Heavenly Father. Jesus taught us to pray to our Heavenly Father. That is, our Father or and the Father of Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's actually closer to 20% of the times, but let's be conservative and say a little over 10%. The point is that God has given us a concept of a Father so that we can better understand God himself. And we can understand that God himself is a father. Now that certainly does not mean, and I don't want to give the impression that I think that all fathers live a godly life. To be honest with you, I wish that were true. I, I, I go a step farther and say, I'm sure it's God's will that that would be true. Those of us who are fathers, we ought to live a godly life. Because we have an example for our children and we lead our children. And so we ought to live a godly life in our character and in our actions. But it doesn't say that all men live godly lives. Matter of fact, the Bible deals with men who don't live godly lives. But it does mean this. It means that God has ordained fatherhood to help us to relate to him as a father. In fact, the entire family unit that God designed, and, and by the way, God designed the family unit. That is not uh, something that some government contrived. It is not, as the term is often used today, a social construct. No, God established the family. When did he do that? Uh, actually, in the Garden of Eden. And he brought uh, the man and the woman together, and he told them that they would multiply and replenish the earth, and there... He established the family and he established the home. So these are establishments of God. It is the design of God. And the entire family unit is a picture or illustration or object lesson to help us understand and grasp the truth of God as the Father. Now, in a representative sense, please don't misunderstand me, because as I've already said, not all men live godly lives. And, and as hard as it is to say, not all women live godly lives. I think more women do than men, to be honest with you, but, um, but it's not 100% true in either case. And then children aren't always who they should be, are they? Well, I, I know you were when you were a child, but, but the rest of us weren't. But in picture, in type, in imagery, the father represents God the Father, the mother would represent the Holy Spirit, and then the children would represent the Son. Now, again, we're not making gods out of people. Don't misunderstand it. I'm saying God's given us a picture or an illustration that we can see in our everyday lives. 
But at the same time God established the home and the family, he established an authority structure. And really this passage that we're looking at in Matthew 21, this parable that he gives here, is an answer to some folks who questioned his authority. Uh, we, get, we can see that uh, when it comes back to verse 23. Uh, and when he, Jesus, was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? Who gave this authority? You know what they're saying to the Lord Jesus? They were saying, what are you doing teaching here in the temple? Who told you you could do that? Who gave you authority to teach here? Who allowed you to do that? Now, he could have said to them, well, this is my house, and you are the intruders here, and I want you to leave. He could have said that, but he didn't. That wasn't his way of operating. Now, he did run some people out of the temple a couple of times, uh, about three years apart. But in this case, rather than dismissing them, rather than chasing them off, he decided to teach these folks. And he taught them about himself. So when we get to verse 26, he's in the middle of that teaching, and he's talking about this parable that's given. But he's showing that God himself is the ultimate authority. And then we have the authority of the parents in the home. Then we have authority in the church. And then we have authority in society where God gave us human government. Paul instructed in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, that we must pray for all those in authority. This is what he says. He said, I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Let me run that by you again. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Not just the ones we like, not just the ones we care about, not just the ones we respect, but for all men. He didn't stop there. When he said, let me start at verse 1 again so you get the flow of thought. I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving thanks be made for all men, for kings. Pray for kings. Isn't that interesting? At the time that Paul wrote this, who was the king where he lived? Well, that would be the emperor of Rome. Was the emperor of Rome very kind to Christians? Well, it depends on which emperor you're talking about, how kind or unkind they were, but none of them were actually very kind to Christians at all. Some of them were more tolerant than others, and some of them were great persecutors. And yet, Paul doesn't get into all that. He just says that we're supposed to pray for all that are in authority, for kings and for all that are in authority. Now, why? Why does God tell us to pray for everybody who's in authority, even when sometimes people in authority aren't kind? Sometimes they're not considerate. Sometimes they're not caring. Sometimes they're very self-centered. Sometimes they're very cruel. So why should we pray for these people? Well, first of all, they're human beings. And God loves human beings in general. Yeah, what about the bad ones? Yeah, God loves them too. If he didn't, we wouldn't be meeting here this morning. But the truth is, God tells us to pray for all that are in authority. So we pray for kings and all that are in authority. Why? The rest of the verse says it. So let me again start at verse 1 so that you get the entire flow of thought. Paul writes, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications... Prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all in authority, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. That's why we need human government. That's why we need laws. That's why we need law enforcement, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I, we live in a day when authority is ignored in many cases, when there are those who want to destroy and do away with authority, there's a word for that, it's called anarchy. Anarchy is the, the belief that there should be no authority, let everybody just do whatever they want to do. That, that was tried, it's been tried. 
If you read in the book of Judges, it says of the people of Israel that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So whatever people thought was right, that's what they do. Is there a problem with that? Sure. What I think is right may not be what you think is right. And what you think is right may not be what I think is right. And then we're going to have difficulty over that. But if there's a standard that we should follow, and by the way, let me insert a little advertisement here. Come Wednesday night and find out why God gave us the law. We're going to be, take a look at it. But the fact of the matter is, if there was no laws, there was no standard of what's right and wrong, then anybody can do anything they want. Well, they can't do it to me. Well, sometimes they can do it to you, even if you don't want them to. I'm tough. I can handle it. Up to a point, I'm sure you can. There's going to come a point where you're not going to be able to. So we need to have laws. We need to have law enforcement. And so God gives us this. And God tells us to honor our parents because he gave them to us as representatives of himself and as authority figures in our life. Now, there's a great deal of scripture that's given to the institution of fatherhood and the reasons that we should, in fact, honor our fathers. Now, if we're going to honor our fathers, a part of that would logically be that we should please our fathers, that we should seek to please our fathers. I, you didn't know my old man, nothing, nobody could please him. Well, that might be true. I, I, you're right, I didn't know your old man. But you might start by not calling him old man. That might be a good way to start honoring your father. I had a, a young boy, really. Uh, he was pretty sure he was still in elementary school at this point. He'd be a grown man now and be a father himself. But he came to me one day and he, he said to me, he said, I know the Bible says I'm supposed to honor my father. And then he said, but my father's done some bad things. And you know what? His father had done some bad. I knew his father. He had done some bad things. Now, if you're waiting for me to tell you what things, I'm not going to. But he had done some bad things. And so this young boy, still in elementary school, said, how can I honor my father when he's done these bad things? Now, I could have come at it from the viewpoint of the theologian said well God says to honor your father so you honor your father just because God said to and there's there's really nothing wrong with that that's valid God says we should do it then we should do it but I took a little different path with him and I thought a minute and I thought did your father ever teach you anything that was good he thought a minute he said well yes I said what did your father teach you that was good and he named three or four things his father had taught him that were good, and they were good things. I said, then you could honor him for that, couldn't you? He thought some more, and he said, yeah, I guess I could. So why didn't I say, well, just do it because God said to? Again, that's valid. It's not wrong. Because I wanted him to see for himself why God had given him that father. Now, we talked in Sunday school class about the word fatherless and that appears many times in the Bible and God talks a great deal about folks who don't have a father for various reasons there can be many reasons why a person doesn't have a father in their home or in their life uh, maybe their father has left maybe their father's passed away maybe they never knew their father there could be so many different reasons why a person doesn't have a father figure in their pic in, in their life's picture so God speaks to those who are fatherless and I challenge the Sunday school class if you have a concordance and for those of you who are sitting there saying a what a concordance is a book or you can find it online and you can pay for it online but I got good news for you, you don't have to because you can find it for free online it is a list of every word that's in the Bible it's a book that contains every word that's in the Bible and every time that word appears in the Bible isn't that a handy tool? So, for example, if you want to look up the word fatherless, you take your concordance, you go to the F's, and you 
look at the word fatherless and you can find every time the Bible uses that word fatherless. And if you want to, you can go read everything the Bible says about that and you're going to be reading for a while because there's a great deal, the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the thing we were looking at this morning in our Sunday school class was from Deuteronomy chapter 24, the latter part of the chapter, where God tells us, the rest of us, all of us, to take care of those who are fatherless. Why? Because they don't have their father there to take care of them. So the rest of us should help take up the slack there. You mean, you mean we got to take them all into our house? It, it doesn't say that. It says you care about them and you help them have their needs met. And you treat them fairly and you treat them with care and you treat them with compassion. <coughs> Pretty much all week this last week, I've heard people say, well, I don't know if we should have Father's Day because there's so many people that don't have their father in their home. Well, there are. And we need to have compassion and we need to care for those folks. We need not to be cold hearted about it. We need not to ignore them, leave them out. But does that mean that we shouldn't honor fathers? No, I'm quite sure it doesn't mean that. So God has us honor our fathers because that is his structure and he wants us to see them and we want to please our, he wants us to see them so that we can relate to him as a father. But I understand, and I've tried to make this clear already, that not every father has acted or is acting in an honorable way. And the idea and the truth uh, that God has given us here is not changed by that. So I want to spend the rest of our time trying to answer this question, how to make dad glad. And you can in most cases. Now, again, there are some men, and I acknowledge this, that no matter what you do, you're never going to please them. Why? Because they just have chosen not to let anybody please them. And that's sad, but it's true. That's not what we're going to see here. Go back to Matthew 21, 28. And Jesus gives this parable because they, people in the temple, men in the temple, have questioned his authority. But look what he says. In verse 28, he says, but what think you? What do you think of this? A certain man has two sons. Now, the Lord Jesus uses that same phrase in two different parables. Here, in this parable, it's called the parable of the two sons. And then in Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, in what's called the parable of the prodigal son. Both cases, you read the phrase, Jesus says, a certain man had two sons. And in both cases, he contrasts those two sons with each other. So the story here is about the father's will and how to honor and please the father. And in this story, Jesus tells of two, a father who tells his two sons to go to work in his vineyard. So what is the father's will in this case? Well, it's obviously for them to go and work in the vineyard. Now, there really isn't much room for misunderstanding what he meant there. Look at it, if you will, 28 again. But what think you? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Any part of that that's hard to understand? No. Go out and work in the vineyard today. I, I don't think the son looked back at his dad and said, Well, I, I don't know what vineyard is. What is a vineyard? He knew what the vineyard was. Well, I, I don't know what kind of work you want me to do. I mean, what does it need out there? He knew that, too. He'd grown up, no doubt, around that vineyard. He'd seen his own father work in the vineyard. He understood. Now, did the vineyard need to be pruned? Did the vineyard need to be uh, watered? Did the vineyard need to be uh, fertilized? Did it need to be harvested? Well, whatever it needed, this boy knew what his father was asking him to do. I want you to go work in the vineyard today. And notice the answer. Verse 29, he, the son, answered and said, I will not. You know what he's saying? No, I'm not doing it. No. I've got other plans today. I've got things that I was going to do. 
Besides, I don't feel like it's hot out there, and I don't want to get all sweaty. And, and I, I'm meeting my friends later on. I, I want to. I don't want to be sweaty and smelly when I meet them. And I, I just, you know, I, I'm not going. So how do you think? How do you think the father felt about that? Well, I don't think he was happy about it. Do you? I mean, this boy flat out refused to do what his father told him to do. And I, I don't think he was happy about that at all. But then, in verse 29, he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented. Yesterday, I saw online where they were having a panel discussion on repentance. And there were probably four or five members on this panel, and they're all going to discuss what is repentance and what it's about and who needs to repent and who doesn't and what does it mean and all that. Can I, can I just take a second and clarify what repentance is? This is going to be so easy you won't believe it. I'm facing the organ, okay? I'm facing the organ. Now I'm going to repent of the organ. What did I do? I turned around. That's what repent means. Repent means you're going the wrong way, turn around and go the right way. That's what it means. You're going the wrong way, turn around. It literally means turn. Oh, I studied the Greek on that pastor, and it means metanoia. It means have a change of mind. Yeah, you changed your mind and quit going the wrong way and turned around and started going the right way. That's what it means. So you change your mind. You change your direction. You're doing something that's wrong, and you're going to quit doing it and turn around and do what's right. And that's exactly what this boy did. He said, I'm not going to work in the vineyard today. But later he realized he was wrong. And he repented, he turned around, he changed his mind, and he went out and worked in the vineyard. Now, that brings us to verse 30. Verse 30, and he, the father, came to the second and said, likewise, said the same thing. What does it mean, likewise? He said, uh, son, go work today in my vineyard. And the second son answered, he answered and said, I go, sir. You know what he said? He said, yes, sir, right away, sir. I'll be out there working in the vineyard. Yes, sir, you can count on me. Absolutely, Dad, you got it. But he never went. He didn't go. He didn't work. Now, the first son gave the wrong answer. He said, no, I'm not. I, I, I won't do it. I'm not going. But he went. The second son says, yes, sir. Yes, sir, whatever, you, I, I'll do it. Yes, I'll carry it out. I know what you want. I'll do it exactly the way you want. Never did a thing. Nothing. Now, both of those boys understood what their father wanted them to do. Both of them understood the words of their father. Both of them understood the will of their father. And the first one rebelled and said, I wasn't doing it, but he did. The second one says, yes, absolutely, I'll go. Now, that second son, his answer, you would think, would please the father. And it would have, except that the father knew his son and probably knew what was really going to happen. The second son matched the description that the prophet Isaiah gave, and then Jesus later quotes it in Matthew 15, 18, where he said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Can I share something with you? God is not looking just for people who talk about him in a positive way. I read this the other day. A friend of mine wrote this, and, and he's a retired pastor. And he said, I think in many churches today, we are in love with loving the Lord more than we love the Lord. Now, I, let's back up and think about that. What do you mean by that? We are in love with loving the Lord more than we love the Lord. And here's what he meant. He mean we love to get together. We need, love to sing God's praises. And is there anything wrong with singing God's praises? No, it's not what he was saying. We love to get together and sing God's praises. And we love the feeling of being together and singing those, those songs that praise God. And again, nothing wrong with that. 
but then we don't really love God. We love the act of loving God, but we, we don't really love him. How do you know that? Because then we don't do what he tells us to do. You know what we're like? We're like this second son who says, I go, sir. I love you, Dad. I'll do whatever you say. I want to do your will. I, yes, sir, count on me. But then he didn't do it. That's what my pastor friend was saying. When he says we love loving God more than we love God. So this young man said that he would go, but then he didn't. So verse 31, Jesus asked a question of these men in the temple who are questioning his authority. He said, whither of them, which one of them, whether them twain, two, did the will of their father? Now, we don't use that word twain a great deal, but it means two. Uh, how many of you ever heard, and, and I'm going to say how many because I was talking to a group of teenagers uh, a while back, and I, I asked them, threw this name out to them, and they all kind of like, never heard of that, don't know who that is. How many of you ever heard of a writer named Mark Twain? You ever heard of him? Okay. He, you, how many of you know that wasn't his name? Okay, a lot of you do. Uh, not all of you. His name was Samuel Clemens. Where did he get Mark Twain? Well, I'll tell you where he got it. He lived along the Mississippi River. He grew up in Missouri along the Mississippi River. And the old river boats that would come up and down the Mississippi River, they needed to know how deep the water was where they were so they didn't run aground. So they would drop a measuring line in the water and get to the bottle, bottom and measure how many fathoms not yards, but fathoms deep the water was. And so he often, as a boy growing up, saw those river boats going up and down the river, and he heard them call out when they dropped that, by the mark or by the measurement, it's two. Only that's not how they said it. They said, by the mark, twain. Two. It's two fathoms deep right here. That's, that's where the name came from. So he just took that when he became a writer and used that for his name. Okay, nobody remembers Samuel Clemens, but a lot of people remember Mark Twain. But that's what he's saying. So by the mark or by the measurement too. So we don't use that word Twain a lot today, but you get it now, I hope. I hope you do. And that's what it means. It just means two. So whether of them two, which one of those two did the will of his father? And that's the point. Which one of them obeyed God? Which one of them recognized God's authority in their life? Which one of them did the will of God and obeyed the word of God? Or, in this illustration that Jesus is giving, which son obeyed his earthly father, knew his father's word, knew his father's will, and did what he knew would please his father? Which one of them worked to make dad glad? They got it. They understood. Whether them twain did the will of his father. They said unto him, the first. They got it. You know what they didn't get? He didn't get that, they were t that he was talking about them. That's what they missed. They understood the story, but they didn't understand that they were the second son in that story. A lot of times we can see somebody else that's getting it wrong, somebody else that's doing wrong. But we don't, we don't seem to understand that we're that person. I've seen many times older men, mostly men uh, that are not from the South, though I'm not saying a man from the South couldn't or wouldn't do this, but I've seen a lot of men from, from the northern part of our country. They're watching uh, somebody, some other fellow do some activity. The one that stands out in my mind uh, there was a guy driving a, a, a racing boat, and the racing boat uh, kind of went like this, you know, kind of came up on one side, and uh, one of the fellows said to the other, he's, he's got it, he's got it, he's got it all wrong there. You know what I found out? It's easy to be the spectator who's watching and criticizing, knowing what the person who's doing something is doing wrong. I'll give you another illustration of that. Some years ago, a couple of the young men here, young adults, were wrestling. And they were on the wrestling mat, and they were wrestling. And I was sitting on the sideline. I'm sitting in a chair. And I'm watching these two guys wrestle. And I look at one, and I say, oh, he could do this. And I look at the other, he could do that. And I, 
Then it occurred to me, I thought, that's easy to say sitting here in the chair. It's a little bit harder when you're the guy out there on the mat. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, we, we tend to do that. We tend to see what other people should do, but we don't see what we should do. And we don't see ourselves in that same situation. And you think maybe, well, if I was driving that boat, I wouldn't have it up like this. Or if I was in that wrestling match, I could get out of that hole. Maybe. But you're not in there right now, are you? You're not the one who's dealing with it right now. So that's only part of what the Lord is saying here. So much more. Let's read verse 31 again. Whether of them twain did the will of their father, of his father, they say unto him the first, uh, they say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto him, Verily, truly, I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now, I'm pretty sure the Lord sat there and said those words and did not raise his hand. But as far as the men who heard that were concerned, he might as well slapped them in the face. That was a great insult to them. Why? Well, first of all, these were religious men. Where were they? They were in the temple. These were religious men. And they weren't just religious men. These were religious leaders. I mean, these were the fellow everybody else looked up to for guidance and instruction and, and to tell them about God and how to know God and how to be like God. These were the, the leaders, the religious leaders. And he just said to them, publicans and harlots, Go into the kingdom of God before you. Now, I hope I don't need to explain to you what the word harlot means. I, I assume you understand that. You may or may not understand what the word publican means. A publican in those days was a tax collector. And he was a tax collector who lived in Israel. But Israel was occupied and controlled by the Romans at that time. And a publican was an Israeli man who had gone to work for the Roman government as a tax collector. So first of all, they didn't like the publicans. They thought they were horrible people because they considered them to be traitors because they went to work for the government that was oppressing them. And that, that is, in fact, what they did do. Secondly, they didn't like the publicans because they felt that they were just the worst people who lived on the entire planet because not only were they traitors who went to work for the Romans, but the Romans didn't pay them. I was explaining this to the, the young folks in the camp this week. They didn't pay them. So how'd they make their money? Well, here's how they made their money. You come to pay your taxes. And the publican's there and he looks down the tax roll and he finds your name and he says, okay, uh, your tax right now is going to be $1,000. And you think, I didn't think I owed that much. In reality, when he looks at the tax roll, you owe $100. But he's going to charge you 1000 Did he get away with that? Yes. Why? Because the, his agreement with the Romans was he didn't get a paid, he didn't get a salary, but whatever he could collect over and above the tax that was due, that was his. So that's how he made his money. And that's how they got rich. And so people not only considered these people to be traitors, they considered them to be cheaters. And you know what? They were. <laughs> they were both. And then Jesus says to these religious men, publicans and harlots, go into the kingdom of God before you will. Wow. Wow. Can you imagine how those fellows felt? What well, can I share with you how they felt? They felt exactly the way the Lord wanted them to feel. Convicted. Convicted. Let's look at it again. Verse 31. Whither them twain did the will of their father? They say unto him, the first, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. And then he explains what he meant by that. Verse 32, and we're finished. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, 
He's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a man who lived with singleness of purpose. He lived his entire life for one reason. He was sent by God. The Gospel of John chapter 1 says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And John, who's writing this, isn't the John that he's talking about. It's not John the Baptist. You mean there's more than one John? Yeah. Do you, how many of you here know somebody named John? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hand down. How many of you know more than one person named John? Yeah, it was the same thing then as it is today. No different. Okay, same idea. So John the Baptist's whole purpose of life was to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, who was coming into the world. It was time was right. They knew from the prophecies of Daniel that the time was right. Daniel prophesies it right down to the year, not the day, not the month, but the year that the Messiah would come, and they knew it was time. And John comes before that, and his entire life is lived to tell people to repent and to get ready because the Savior is coming. And that's what he did. So, verse 32, John, meaning John the Baptist, came unto you in the way of righteousness, preaching righteousness, showing you the way of righteousness, doing exactly what God wanted him to do, and ye believed him not. You didn't believe him when he said the Savior is coming, the Messiah is coming, he's soon to be here, and then towards the end of his life, John said he is here. One day, you read this in John chapter 1, one day John is out there with his disciples and he sees Jesus. And he points to him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. You know what John's saying? I've been telling you he was coming. There he is. There he is. That's the one I've been talking about. So John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. You didn't believe him when he said the Messiah is coming. You didn't believe him when he said the Messiah or the Savior is here. You didn't believe John writes about this again in chapter 1, verse 12. It says of Jesus, he, Jesus, came unto his own, his own people, and his own received him not. They didn't believe in him. They didn't trust him. Next verse, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to those who did, to them gave he the power or authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Is what he's saying here. John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. You didn't believe him. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. You know why? They knew they were sinners. They knew that they were doing the wrong thing. They knew they had much for which they needed to be forgiven. They knew who they were. These religious leaders, they didn't think they needed to be forgiven. They didn't think they'd done anything wrong. They thought everything they did was right. They thought they were right about everything and everybody, and if they did it, it had to be right because they were doing it. That's how they thought. Well, they knew the law. Well, they did. No question about that. They knew the law. You know what else they knew? They knew an extra set of writings that were commentaries on the law, and they actually thought more of those writings than they did of the Scripture itself. They prided themselves on that. And so the Lord says, the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when you had seen, when you had seen it, when you saw the publicans and the harlots turning to God, giving up their sin, going away from their sin, giving their heart to God, when you saw them believing the Messiah, when you saw it, you repented not afterward that you might believe him. Yeah, you like to point out the sin of those people, those publicans over there, those harlots over there. Yeah, boy, if anybody needed to get right with God, it's them, but you never see that it's you. It's you. I suppose, it doesn't say this in scripture, this is pure supposition, but I suppose that when Jesus said that, there was a unified gasp among these fellows. I imagine they all went, <gasps> and probably didn't breathe for 10 minutes. 
maybe not quite that long. They were shocked at what the Lord said. But the Lord explained it. Those horrible publicans and harlots, those nasty people, they just, they just never do what's right. Yeah, boy, do they need to get right with God. But us? We don't, no. No, that's not us. John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. You want to do God's work? Here it is. That you believe on him whom he has sent. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Want to do God's work? Want to do God's will? Believe in him who he sent. Who's that talking about? It's talking about the Lord Jesus. He's saying, you men witnessed these publicans and harlots turning to God and being saved. You saw that and you should have seen that you could be saved the same way. And you should have seen that this was the will of the Father. But you would not humble yourself enough to realize that you were sinners just as bad or worse than those other people. You didn't see it. So what we understand here is that obeying the word of God and obeying the will of God pleases the Father. So let me come to the conclusion here. I'm going to give you five things. Give you five things how to make dad glad, how to please your father in heaven, and how to please your father on earth. Hey, you made up the list. I didn't make it up. I didn't. Where'd you get it? Book of Proverbs. It's, it's very clear in the book of Proverbs. Five things, five ways to make dad glad. First thing we think about is understand the word and the will of God and do it. And what is the word and the will of God? This is the work of God that you believe on him who he has sent. That's, that's where you start right there. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's where you start. No question about it. That's John 6, 29. Let me give it to you again. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of the Father, that you believe on him who he has sent. That's John 6, 29. John 6, 47. Same speaker, Jesus. Same passage, talking to the same audience. Says, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. Believe in Jesus. Be saved. Trust him to save you. Five things. How to make dad glad. Proverbs 10.1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father. Be wise. Be wise. Oh, okay. That's pretty generic. I mean, be wise. What does it mean, be wise? You know what's interesting? The book of Proverbs, a proverb by definition is a wise saying. There's lots of different proverbs. I've told you this before. There's all kinds of different proverbs. Here, here's an old Chinese proverb. It's not God's word. It's not meant to be God's word, but here it is. Find more ways to save life than to take it. Avoid rather than check. Check rather than avoid. Maim rather than kill. For all life is precious. And none can be replaced. That's a good proverb. It's not God's word. It doesn't come in the Bible. It's not inspired by God. But it's a good proverb. Let me give you another one. This comes from a, a couple of books that my children gave me years ago because they know I love stuff like this. And it's there's two books of cowboy proverbs. Okay, I'm I'm give you a couple of them. Number one, the title of the first book is Never Squat When You're Wearing Your Spurs. <laughs> now see, there's wisdom in that, isn't there? There's wisdom in that. Another one says, never slap a man who's chewing tobacco. See, you see the wisdom in that, don't you? Another one says, don't drink downstream from the herd. See, see you, you get this. You understand, don't you? See, there's wisdom in that. Those are wise things. Is that God's word? No. But is that a proverb? Yes. But the book of Proverbs is part of the inspired word of God. And if you want to know wisdom, study the book of Proverbs. And you're going to find wisdom there. You know what a lot of people do? And I, I confess to you, I've done this, but I don't do it all the time. But a lot of people read the book of Proverbs every month. Why? Because they want that wisdom. Here's how they do it. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. One month only has 28 days, and every four years has 29. Few of them have 30, but most months have 31 days. So what you do is you read the chapter that corresponds with the day of the, the month it is. And you know what to read. It's real simple. 
very effective. A wise son maketh a glad father. How do I be wise? Study God's word. Learn the wisdom from it. But a foolish son is a heaviness to his mother. You know what that means? It means that foolish son, the one who's foolish in behavior, the one who's dishonorable in character, the one who's disobedient to the word and the will of God, brings heaviness or sadness to the mother or dishonors the mother. A wise son makes a glad father, makes glad, dad glad. But a foolish son breaks his mother's heart. Second one, Proverbs 13, 1. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Now what is rebuke? Rebuke is when somebody's doing something wrong and you point it out to them and you tell them that they're doing wrong. You know what I've discovered in my lifetime? Most people don't like to be told that they're doing something wrong. They don't want to hear it. Why? Because they're doing what they want to do. But a wise son heareth his father's instruction. A wise son will learn from his father. My, my father taught me some very valuable lessons in my lifetime. He did. My father taught me how to tie my shoes. That's been very valuable to me. It has. He taught me some things about driving that they don't teach you in driving school. He taught me how to drive at high speeds and things like that. And boy, did I use that a lot. But the, the point is, my father taught me a lot of things. The sad part is I didn't learn all that he had to teach. That, that, that's where I missed the boat. Oh, well, like what, for example? Oh, many things, but here's one. In the 1960s, my father worked. He went to work every day in a room about this size. In the middle of that room, there was a machine about the size of our church van out there. If you want to see the van afterwards, see how big it is. The machine sat right there. It was an IBM System 3. It was a computer. It didn't have a screen. It didn't have a mouse. It didn't have a keyboard. It used punch cards. And you keyed in on the punch cards, you put the punch cards in the machine and it ran it and gave you a printout. But my father said to me, this was in the 1960s, he said, learn computers, they are the future. Was he right? Yes, he was right. Did I listen? No. Okay. Should I have listened? Yes. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. But a scorner heareth not rebuke. A scorner, in this case, is a person who mocks their teachers. The scorner will never admit that they are wrong or that they've ever done anything wrong. When they're rebuked, when they've been shown that they're wrong, they mock the person who tried to teach them. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. A wise son maketh a glad father. Number three, Proverbs 15, 20. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son despises his mother. And you say, well, that sounds just like the first one you read. Well, it's very close to it. But in the first verse, it says he the heaviness to his mother. Here he says he despises his mother. This foolish son who is an adult, who should be mature in making adult decisions, despises his mother. That means he is so very selfish that he causes other people to think that his mother is a vile and worthless woman when he is the vile and worthless person. But others say, well, she must be bad. Look at the way her son turned out. Can, can I help you with that as, as one parent to another? Let me ask you a question. We're talking about fathers here. How many, raise your hand, how many of you think that God is a good father? Okay, most of you do. I, I think God is the ultimate good father. You can't, all fathers should pattern being a father after God. How many of you think that God, who is a good father, has some children that didn't turn out well? Raise your hand, yeah. Pretty obvious, isn't it? So the fact that the children don't turn out well, I'm not trying to absolve parents of responsibility. Please understand that. But the fact that a child does not turn out well doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't do what was right as a parent. If that were 100% true, 
then what do you do about God and his children? So this foolish son causes other people to think bad thoughts about his mother. He despises his mother. Proverbs 28, 7. Number four. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son. That, now we're getting something here, aren't we? How do you get to be a wise son? Get into the law. Get into the Bible. Get into what God's word says and learn it. But he that is a companion of riotous men shames his father. The wise son honors and obeys the word of God and the will of God and the will of his earthly father. The foolish son is the companion of fools. That's a pretty good description of the parable that Jesus gave of the prodigal son, isn't it? The foolish son went out and wasted his substance with riotous living. The wild prodigal son. But you know that son later repented. He came back. He came home. He was forgiven. And his father welcomed him home. Was glad to see him. A lot like what we read in this parable, isn't it? The wise son recognizes his own sin. The wise son repents. The wise son comes to his father for mercy. And the wise son, therefore, honors his father. The wise son honors his father and his mother with their words, with his words, with his action, with his daily life. What about those of us who have failed in that? Well, that's why we have grace. That's why we have forgiveness. That's why we have the gospel. You see, God the Father knew that his people, his children, were going to go astray. So long before that, he made a plan. And his plan was to redeem them. Not to excuse them. Forgiveness is not being excused. Forgiveness is understanding that the debt has been paid. So God so loved the world, that's the people of the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ. And if you read the Bible, you'll find many places where other people sons of God oh I don't know about that giving yeah you do I just said it to you a little while ago John 1 12 but as many as received him to them gave he the power or authority to become the sons of God even them that believe on his name everybody who believes in him everybody who's trusted him everybody who's been born again is a child of God now we don't base it on that one verse you can you can go on throughout the rest of the New Testament and find that Let's go over to 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, Whosoever, anybody who believes that Jesus is the Christ, doesn't mean that there was a man named Jesus, his last name was Christ, doesn't mean that. You believe that Jesus, who came here, Jesus of Nazareth, was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. You trust him as Savior. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Goes on in that chapter and saying, this is the record that God has given to us of his Son. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. What's the name of the Son of God? Some of you knew. Let's try it again. What's the name of the Son of God? Okay. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. You trusted in him. You believed in him. You placed your faith in him that you may know, not guess, hope, maybe so. You may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe, trust in the Son of God. That's a promise. That's a promise and tells you you can know that you have eternal life. By extension, you can know that you're a child of God. Now, what if I haven't trusted? Then you aren't the child of God but Jesus is God's only begotten son the rest of us are children by adoption Jesus is God's only begotten son so I challenge you if you're a child of God be obedient 
to your heavenly father. And part of that is honoring your earthly father. Yeah, yeah, but I told you before, preacher, you don't know what he's done. I don't. I don't. And I'm not defending any man who's done wrong. You hear me and understand that. I'm not sticking up for him. But I heard an old fella years ago say this. He said when he was a boy, his father was a drunkard. And his father had not taken care of the family. And his father had not provided for the family. And his father was not around when he needed him. And this little boy could not understand how he would honor his father. And there was a lady. She wasn't part of the family, but somebody that the family definitely knew. And she said this to him. She said, the Bible says, honor your father. I alluded to this kind of situation earlier. The Bible says, honor your father. It doesn't say honor your father if he does what he ought to do. It says, honor your father. That boy never forgot that. And as he grew up and he became a father himself, he honored his father in the way he lived and the way he acted. Now, he didn't build a monument to his father. He didn't go to that monument and bow down and say, oh, great, wonderful father that you were. You were everything every man could ever want. Nothing like that happened, nor should it have happened. But the way he honored his father was being a good man himself and being the man he ought to be. So I challenge you, be obedient to God. Be a witness of this lost world and make your dad glad because you know his word, you know his will, and you do it. That's how you make dad glad. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for the time we've had together. And Lord, it is our earnest prayer that you would help us to recognize you as our Heavenly Father, as the one who provides for us, the one who cares for us, the one who is the authority in our life. And Lord, let us recognize your word and learn your word and think about it and meditate on it and just decide to follow it. Help us, Lord, to determine that we will follow and do your will. Help us, Lord, to be the men and the women that we ought to be. And honor our Father which is in heaven. And thereby, we will honor our Father on earth. But Lord, it might be that there's somebody who's listening today, either in person or online, who doesn't know you as their Father. They've never come to the point where they realize that they, like all of us, are a sinner. They've never come to the point where they realize that when Jesus gave himself on the cross, he paid for their sins, just as he paid for ours. And that he rose from the grave and he says, come to me and I will save you. I will forgive you. He that believes on me has everlasting life. Trust in me. Believe in me. Understand that your sin debt was paid at the cross. And if you're here this morning or you're listening, you say, that sounds kind of good to me, but I'm not sure I understand it all. I invite you to do two things. Number one, I'm going to pray a prayer in a moment. If you mean to say it and it's what you want to say, I'm going to ask you to say the same thing. You don't need to say it out loud. God knows your heart. But if you don't mean it, it's not what you want to say, then don't say it. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is this. Come and talk to us. Let us help you. We'll not tie you up for a long time. We'll just take the Bible and simply show you in a few moments the answers that you're looking for. How to know that you have eternal life. Here's that prayer. Call on the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that you paid for my sins at the cross. I believe that you rose from the grave. I believe that you are the living son of God. I trust you to forgive my sins, to save my soul, to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Now, maybe you prayed that prayer, maybe you didn't. Do you have a question about it? Then come and let's talk. Again, we'll not tie you up for a long time. We'll just talk to you very quickly and simply. Help you to understand. If you're here this morning, you say, I know the Lord. I've got that settled. Wonderful. Praise God for you. But maybe the Lord's spoken to you in another way this morning. And maybe you want to come and get things settled with him today. You know God's been dealing with you. It might not be anything I've said at all this morning, but you know God's speaking to you, and you need to do business with him. This is your opportunity. Come while we sing. Father, bless and move this invitation time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.